I want to welcome you back to the ship, uh, Mr. Ackerman. Thank you. Yes, welcome home. Thank you. Uh, is this your first time back, sir? Yes, first first time back here. And how's it feel to be back? Very strange. It's very strange. It's like it's like deja vu here again. I was like amazing seeing the spaces and and the areas I worked. The um, machine shop. I actually came from a machine shop. Uh, worked in F steering when I first got here. It's it's, it's like runs a runs a chill up your back. You know, seeing all the stuff that I've been through here. Okay. So let's begin the conversation by asking your current age, sir. Age is 57. Okay. And so let's open up the story with how you got involved in the Navy. Uh, we can start with any inspirations you might have had. Oh, inspirations. Well, I knew, I knew, I worked, uh, when I got out of high school, I worked for about a year in a machine shop. And I said, oh, you know, I knew I was in college material. I said, you know, I got to do something than just nothing. So... I said, you know, I said, I said, I said, I have to do, I have to do something. So I'll, I end up joining the service. Okay. And uh, you picked the Navy over the other branches? Believe it or not, I went to the Air Force first. And they would give me a little bit of run around. And I walked out of the Air Force recruiting office and I walked by the Navy recruiting office. And he says, what, did, did, did things go well? And I said, no, things didn't go too well in there. Oh, come on in here. And that's, believe it or not, that's how I got into the <laughs> Navy. Walked by the right walked by the Navy recruiting office and he said come on in and before you know it here I am oh yes yes uh, I went through the same thing except from Navy to Army uh, yeah <laughs> it's like you know okay Air Force lost out all right and how old were you when you uh, joined the Navy oh was that 19 yeah right around 19 okay yes where'd you go for basic training Orlando Orlando yes okay. how was that like anything remember from there oh uh, interesting it was it was kind of, actually, I was serious when I got there, but then at, towards, towards the end there, it was kind of laughable. You know, I remember doing push-ups down there, and he was telling, telling us, up, down, up, down, and we'd all wait for him to walk the other way, and we'd just lay down on the ground and go, oh, like we're kind of trying to, <laughs> and he'd turn around, we'd lift up, we'd go, start, it was kind of laughable towards the end there, you know, so, but it was, it was pretty interesting, you know. So. Okay. And uh, you didn't have a rate by then, right? So no, I was just E1, right at the bottom. Okay. So yes. Yes, I didn't have a rate at all when I went in. So you didn't have to go to A school? Nope, didn't even go to A school. But I really didn't know what I wanted to say. Here it goes back to when I was at, went, went to the recruiting office. It's like, you know, what do I do? I, I knew I wanted to be in engineering. You know, I was good with my hands. I was good mechanically inclined. But as far as being an electrician, a plumber, or, you know, or a machinist, or working in the engine room, I didn't really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I said, you know what, I'll go in as a non-rate. And then, and then I went in as a non-rate and went to boot camp as an E1. Okay. All right, so after boot camp, where'd you go next? Uh, right right to, to Jersey. Went, pulled up, and I remember walking in the main gate of Long Beach. And actually, I, I seen one of the guys there. Um, he was, um, he was a in my boot camp and I said, Oh, how you doing? And we were walking in we were walking in and we walked in the main gate, going to the ship. And it's like we both looked at each other and go, Oh, what do we do? We seen this big ship and there's all in scaffolding and dry dock. It's like, you know. So it, it came aboard the ship in eighty eighty two and they put us on barges. It's like, what? Well of course the ship was in scaffoldings, it was being redone, it was recommissioning. And yeah, it was pretty interesting. I had to go back and forth from um, the barges to the ship. Worked on, worked as we had to do. I had to do like fire watch, do watch, do fire watch, have an extinguisher, and go aboard a ship next to a welder and watch them weld and make sure there's no fires. Actually, sometimes there was two of them, depending on what the guy was welding. So okay, but were you assigned to the ship or did you request it? They were assigned. We were assigned. Okay. Actually, three of us out of boot camp. I think I met three guys out of boot camp. That that happened to get to ship, and it was right. Well, I'm, I'm a plank owner, you know. Like I said, we came here. It was it was in dry dock, you know. Okay. Sparks everywhere flying from welders and all that. So. Okay. What was your first impression when you saw the ship? Oh my God, you know, like I told you when we walked in, it's oh man, what do we do? We like, you know, what are we gonna do on the ship? It's like it was it was pretty interesting, you know. It's like, you know. 
funny feeling like oh man we didn't know what was in store for us it's like oh so okay all right so you got on board when the ship was still being a uh, refurbished right? yes okay so you work with some of the yard birds as they call it yes the yard birds okay yes yeah right. anything else remember during the refit no it's just basically it's just that was my daily job fire watch every day you know go across fire watch you know go back to barge eat you know of course it's, it's you know basic i was e e1 and i really wasn't anything then you know okay so uh, did you get to attend the recommissioning ceremony? Yes. Um, okay. Mr. Reagan, President yes, Reagan came. President Reagan. Yes, and we were there. We were all standing out front. He came aboard and did his speech, you know, while we were all standing at attention outside, all, off the ship. So. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was 82, I believe. That was back in 82. Yes, 82. Yes. Yes. All right. So that, was, that was his flagship, I believe. I think that was his ship, you know. Yeah. So. All right. So you were not on board yet during that ceremony, right? No. Well, I'm trying to remember if they we were actually they moved us aboard then, I believe. Okay. You know, I believe we were moved aboard by then. Okay. Do you remember where you were watching it from? Um, when Reagan came. Uh, yes. Yes, it was it was starboard side, and we were just off on uh, on the pier. We were all lined up, and Reagan pulled up. Actually, went on. So we were watching. We were watching off the ship. We weren't on the ship. I can't remember if we ran on the ship. It's, I believe after the speech, we all ran ran on the ship. You know, as part of the uh, commissioning. So. Okay. Yeah, I believe they did that to the sister ships. They yes. might have done it to the to the New Jersey as yes, well. Yes, I. It's, you know, like I said, it's been a while, and I believe I believe we actually all got up and all ran on the ship. Okay. So, interesting. It was interesting right. times. All right, so after that, did you go to sea trials? Yep, went to sea trials. Uh, yeah, that was, that was interesting, too, you know. Yes. Right. So, so uh, on the ship, your first duty was uh, aft steering, right? Yes, aft steering. Okay, yeah, you were still not rate at the time, right? Yeah, E1. Oh, you were still E1? E1. Okay. What can you talk about uh, your duties there? Yes, I um, stood watch and aft steering. Uh, while we were on the way, and uh, stood watch at anchor windlass, you know, when we came into port, and it was pretty interesting aft steering, you know. We I remember this chief. He told us, hey, you know, we he wanted to tile the floor, and I says, you know what, to tile we need to tile this floor. Well, everybody agreed we shouldn't tile the floor, but you know, he insisted on tile. We put laid all this tile down on the floor, and chief goes. Okay, looks good, looks good. And all of a sudden, a week later, all the tiles started sliding around. Well, aft steering, hydraulic oil, it's oily down there. We had to scrape all that tile up. And man, I get seasick, of course, I get seasick, and I joined the service, I joined the Navy. You know, I'm scraping up the tile, and I was sick. <sighs> he didn't care. I ended up scraping all that tile up, cleaning up, you know. But aft steering, in general, was actually a nice, I was actually glad I was in aft steering and hydraulics over the engine room. Them guys in the engine room, I'm glad I was down there. You know, at least I got to see a little bit of daylight in aft steering. Okay. So. Did you get to operate some of that equipment in there? Yes. Uh, changing units from port to starboard, you know. Um, we, we Usually when the, um, the guy in charge, the, the captain or whatever was in charge up there, XO, he, when we had to switch units, we had to um, switch from port to starboard unit. So, usually the boatman was, was done that too sometimes, but usually they didn't know how to do it because you had to get the pumps, the, the pressure off the pumps on both pumps before you could switch the units. So usually we did that. It switched port and starboard cables, you know, operated that, and made sure oil was maintained in the expansion tanks, you know, and basically that was all we did down there. It, everything operated pretty well down there. There was nothing actually really broke down, you know where I had to get myself involved. So everything was cut and dried on there. Okay. And how long did you have that duty for? Oh, i say probably 83, 83. Yeah, about 83, I decided to go to the machine shop and work in a machine shop. 
you know. So I, I became an MR, MR, and worked in a machine shop. There's probably a pretty good sized shop, probably about five, six machines, lace and one mill, planer, you know. So basically, machine shop, we manufactured shafts, a lot of valve cutting. Of course, an old chip. You know, valves leak by, need to cut the seats on the valves, cut the disc on the valves. So we did a lot of valve cutting and, of course, pump shafts. Basically, did anything that the ship needed at that time. Okay. So anything that broke or wore down, yes. you would repair? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so that was your second duty there? Yes. Yeah, it was my second duty. Worked on, like I said, worked on valves. I remember one time... Uh, ship went down in the water and they had to bring this valve up and they said hey we need this valve right now we this we're down we're down so I remember cutting this valve on the big gap lathe and the engineers behind me breathing down my neck captains coming down and saying, how long much more longer how much more longer I was like holy cow You're trying to block them out so you know don't stress too much I, I remember cutting that valve and putting a valve in place and dig in nothing for it just an attaboy but I guess that was my job, so. All right, and the captain did come down? He came down, he didn't actually talk to me, he was talking to the uh, chief, chief in, in charge of the engine room, and asking him how long it would take. I remember him talking in the background while I was um, cutting that valve. Okay, this was Captain Milligan or Fogarty? You know, what? I can't remember which one those were. Um, I can't remember if it was Captain Milligan or Fogarty, but I remember him coming down checking on the ship. Okay, yeah. you had to stand attention when he came in? Oh, uh, I don't actually remember that either. I think, no, he came in. I was working. Okay. So basically, you got a machine running, and you're, you know, captain on deck, you know. I ain't going to stop cutting my, turn off my machine, and, you know. I'm in the middle of a cut. Okay. So I don't think I even, I don't think I even turned around. <laughs> I just stepped cutting, so. Oh, okay. I didn't think he had a problem with that either because the ship was down in the water, so. All right. Okay. All right. You had this uh, duty during the deployment to Beirut, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Work, worked in the machine shop as I went to Beirut. Okay. So uh, let's talk about that uh, deployment. Uh, what do you remember from there? Well, I think we were in a Westpac. And we were in the middle of a Westpac, and then all of a sudden, that's when the Beirut, the crisis of Beirut came out. And I remember all of a sudden, boom, we were, that was it. Went to Panama City, took on stores through Panama Canal, and went on to Beirut. You know, I remember off the coast of Beirut, a long time, back of Beirut on the right, Beirut on the left, just up and down the shoreline, you know, for a long period of time. Okay. How was the transition to the canal? Oh, it was pretty rough. I think, I don't know, they said it was scraping the sides. The ship was pretty big, it was scraping the sides. I think, I don't know if it was like anywhere from six inches to a foot on each side. You could hear it. You can hear it going through the Pan Pan Panama Canal, going through it, scraping the sides. Once I got through the other side, it looked marshy. It was pretty marshy. And uh, it, was, it was an interesting time, went through. And I tell you what, it didn't take us long to get to Beirut. We were, we, that ship was rumbling all the way to Beirut. Okay. But did you get to watch the ship transition from the decks or were you down oh, below? Oh, no, I was down below. Okay. And room, you don't see daylight too much. Okay. <laughs> no, I never actually went up. Actually, no, I did go up after we went through the canal. After we went through the canal, I did go up, and that's when I seen how, you know, it looked marshy and up there. I did go up for a little bit, but back down. Okay. Now, while you're at the machine shop, your battle stations was just outside of it, right? Yes, yes. I just, right outside of it, it was just, I worked in damage control. So basically, all we did, we were part of, I was part of a fire, fire crew, and we stood by just in case anything, like a fire would break out for battle stations. So basically, thank God nothing happened, and you know, but I was part of the damage control. Okay. So upon arrival off the coast of Beirut, uh, did the captain or anybody brief you of the situation that was going on? Yes, actually, you know, they 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 just said that um, we were deployed to Beirut. Reagan said that. Um, um, there's issues with Beirut, and so we deployed there. The Marines were on land, and I never could figure out why the Marines were not armed. They never armed them. 
They, they were armed, but they weren't allowed to carry ammunition or a gun. That's always, always told. I don't know how true that was. And supposedly, I was actually there for the, um, when the Marines got bombed. And, um, and I was talking to a group of people, they were corpsmen, and they said they were, came aboard our ship, and there were some people were coming aboard our ship for injuries and stuff like that. And I remember one of the guys saying that, you know, he talked to one of the individuals at the gate, and he says he couldn't get the ammunition and the gun, he couldn't get the clip and the gun, he couldn't. And that's what he kept saying over and over, I couldn't get the clip and the gun, I couldn't get the clip and the gun. And I don't know how true that is, but... You know, so but we did take people in off the shore when um, that crisis happened, oh, when so that bomb came through the gates. So you took some casualties. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Uh, some Marines did confirm that yes, they were not allowed to be armed. Yes, their rifles were unloaded and they were just there for deterrent. Yes, and then I, like I said, I spoke to one of the corpsmen there, and he said he says that one of the guys kept saying I could not get the clip in the gun. I, which you know what, wartime, I don't know why. You know, that could have made the difference of the world right there, having okay. the clip in the gun. Okay. Okay. So maybe, who knows, some break through the gate, guy panicking, can't get the clip in the gun, you know? Sounds like it could have actually happened to me. Okay. Uh, what was the reaction of the crew uh, when that news came in? Um, quiet, you know, not, not, no, nobody responding, nobody saying anything. Um, I believe it went to battle stations, too. Yes, we went, I believe we went to battle stations, and I don't know if it was that day or next day or a couple of days later, we, we retaliated, you know. Uh, I think it was 240 high explosive shells we launched in Syrian targets. So everybody says, oh, we, we never did nothing. I think we did, you know. We launched 16 inch shells, 200, all day. I was battle, uh, battle stations all day, you know, hearing them guns go off, okay. you know. Uh, what was it like? Uh, hearing those guns go off while you're in your battle stations. Uh, loud. <laughs> you know, you hear them, you know, saw, sa what do you call them, salvos, salvos going off. Salvo alarms. Yeah. But, um, that, um, yeah, it was pretty interesting, you know, you're sitting there, ship shaking, you know, it's like, holy cow, pipes vibrating, it's like, it felt like you're going to shake yourself apart, you know. So. Did you get to hear the five-inch guns fire as well? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, they, you know, after you hear 16-inch guns, 5-inch ain't as impressive as a 16s, you know. But you did hear them go off. Okay. We did, I don't know how many shells of this 5-inch. I don't think we shot either 5-inch. I think we were too far out, you know. I mean, you, they go, what, 21 miles? 23 for the 16 and 10 yeah. for the 5. Yes, I don't know if we were that close. I think we were just sitting. They said that they were seeing um, people on the beach shooting their guns at us. They were actually, sh you know, they were just on the beaches shooting at us. But of course, you know, we're we're like way out at sea. Their guns ain't making it to us. I guess the people up on the bridge were saying that they were, you know, guys on the beaches shooting at us because we were shooting at them at the time. You know, right. so. Yeah. What was the reaction of the crew when uh, this ship opened fire? Um, kind of excited, you know, like, hey, yes, okay, you know, we're we're doing something here, you know, we're. You know, I think some were quiet, you know, and mixed, mixed reactions through the crew. Okay. So, you know. Now, in the aftermath of that bombing, uh, it is said that some of the crew went to Beirut and actually stepped foot to help out with the crisis. Uh, um, there was a corpsman. The corpsmen's went to Beirut, not just, not the, I don't know how many crew members. I know corpsmen's went on, on okay. land. But some people, I believe, yeah, some of them went, came on our ship. You know, I believe there were some Marines on my, on my ship that were from the base. They flew them off onto our ship. And I could, I had, it's, it's pretty hard to remember that, but I vaguely remember talking to some of the people aboard the shore, of course, like I said, the corpsmen. Okay. You know. Uh, you never stepped foot on shore, did you? No, I never did, thank God. Okay. Right. Uh, also, shortly during this time, uh, Bob Hope had his USO performance. On, uh, you remember that event? Yes, I do remember him coming aboard, but I had to stand duty. And it's like, you know, well, uh, hey, someone's got to stand duty. You know? So while the show was going on, I was watch, standing watching half steering. But I did have the advantage to actually get a signature off of him because one of the boats' mates were saying, hey, you know, they're walking right past the, the, the aft steering. And I said, oh, yeah. So I said, I'm going up there. I believe there's some other, 
I believe there were some other um, people that was with him too that were famous. Uh, Brooke Shields was one. Oh yeah, there you go. That's right. Yeah. Uh, did I get her? I might have gotten her autograph too. But anyways, they're walking past half steering. So as soon as I went up, Bob Hope walked was right there and said, "Hey, Bob Hope, can I have your autograph? I can't see. You. I can't." He stopped and signed his autograph and gave it to me. And I, I believe Brooke Shields, Brooke Shields was with him too. And I believe I got his her autograph too, along with his. Uh -huh. So. But I never did get to see the, see the show. Of course, some people got to stay on duty. You know, everybody can't be there. So, but I did see some shows. Oh, what the heck was that guy's name? Oh, there was one gentleman I seen. Oh, you would think I would remember this, but I don't remember. I oh. see another. I think Dallas cheerleaders came aboard. Yeah, Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. Yes, yeah, they came aboard. So I seen that show too. Yeah, but at least. That was nice that they actually, you know, we had a good time when they came, you know, show a little bit of respect or not respect our support is the word I want to use, that they came aboard and supported us. Okay. Uh, other than his autograph, did you interact with uh, Mr. Hope in any way? No, basically it was, he had to get up on deck and do his show, you know, he didn't, didn't re interact with him too much. Oh, here you go, sir, here you go, you know, you know here you go, and just on the way he went. Okay. Brooke Shields gave me her autograph, and, and that was it. Okay. All right, so while we're at the USO uh, show part, uh, what do you remember on board the ship with everyday life as far as, like, recreation or anything you get to watch on the TV? Um, recreation, I didn't do too much watching TV, but they didn't have movie night. I think it was every 8 o'clock at night. Sometimes you got to watch it. Sometimes you didn't, depending on if you had duty, or sometimes you were just too uh, too tired. Um, we had weight room. Um, uh, what other? I've got a library. But basically, when I was at sea, you know, I did watch, sometimes I went and watched a movie, but basically when I was at sea, I was like either working or sleeping, eating, you know. Some of the watches were 18, or what is it, 16 hour watches, you know. So, I was like, you know, when you got off, you were either sleeping or eating or something to that effect. Okay. So. Uh, what about mail call? Mail call, eh, yeah. basically got mail, pass it out. I wrote a lot. I got, actually my parents kept all my letters. I do have all my letters. And mail call, yeah. I got some gifts, you know, some cookies and, you know. Stuff like that in the mail okay. from my parents. Did they have to open up the packages? No, I don't remember that? that at all, actually. Okay. Did no, I don't remember them opening my packages at all. Okay, but they did read your mail beforehand? No, they didn't read my mail. Did, uh, did they have people read I, that? That's all. I never heard that before. Okay. Other crew members, they had to read their mail? Uh, no, but sometimes for security, they might want to send No, something. they weren't doing any of that. Okay, that was probably during certain times then. Uh, I don't know. I don't. They don't. My my envelope was sealed shut when I got it. Okay. So. All right. Uh, you said you mentioned the your like own weight room or weight room that you had either yeah, yourself or and some others. Forward distilling distilling plant. We had a weight room back in the back on the right side on the bottom, and everybody go down there and we collected weights. All of us and over time collected a bench bar bench. You know, some weights here, some weights there. We had our own little weight room down there, forward distilling plant. You know, that was that was nice. Okay. And these yeah. like dumbbells or yeah, all that. Yeah, we just collect them over time. And I, I'd actually like to go down there and see if they are still there. You know, nobody took them. When you, when you get off, you're just like you you were done with the ship. You know, I'm thinking they're still down there. And, you know, right. so now, how'd you stabilize all that equipment uh, when the ship was going out? We see. Yeah. We didn't stabilize it. Okay. You know, if it was rolling around, it probably didn't hurt anything anyway. It's just in a void. Okay. You know, it's just down there. You know, it, we didn't rock like a destroyer. You know, it was pretty stable. It, it, some of the seas were a little rough, but it was not that bad. You know, so. Okay. Uh, how was the food on board? Oh, great. It was funny. Breakfast every morning. There was a long line. It's like, oh man, long line. I'd wait for the cooks to mess up one of someone's breakfast because they, they, they serve omelets to order. Whatever you want on the on cheese, mushrooms, sausage. 
So I'd wait for, oh, I got an omelet here with just cheese on it. Anybody want? I messed it up. And I'd always grab that omelet. I didn't care. Go ahead of the line, get my omelet, and go, go on my way. You know? I didn't care if someone messed my omelet up. I'll take a cheese omelet. I don't care. I'll take a sausage mushroom omelet with some, that one of the cooks messed up on. So, yeah. But the food, uh, the food is pretty good. Uh, milk. Oh, it was horrible. It was, a, you can, it was like in a box. It wasn't really milk. It was like um, potter type milk. It was not. You didn't need. It's a non refrigerated refrigerated on the on the container. So bug juice. They called it bug juice. It was actually Kool Aid. That was that was pretty good. So, yeah. but the food was pretty good all in all. Okay. And you said you were a shellback, right? Yes, shellback. Golden shellback, actually. Okay. And across zero zero longitude latitude zero zero, so it made me a golden shell back. Okay. Yes. Anything you want to talk about that event? <laughs> I'm sure every sailor has a story about that. And it was pretty interesting. They had they they had all all set up. They had food food in, in these bags, or these you had to crawl through this food. You had to stick your head in the toilet and get a piece of hot dog out. It was pretty interesting. The toilets were not hooked up. They were just like uh, unhooked toilets, and they just threw food in there, and they told you you had to grab something out of there. And it, and I remember I remember the boom. They had somebody swinging from the boom, the boat boom, that collected stores. They had some guy swinging from that. It was an officer. He was... <laughs> It was pretty. It was pretty interesting. I, I think they just they just took them like six foot off the ground. They didn't take them way up, you know. It was and they had wog dogs walking around, and they 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 made people wog dogs, and they made tack other wog. You could be a wog dog. It was it was you know an experience. So okay. And at the end, what I remember again, we big old shoot we got in. Got showered off. It, ho it was hoses out there, and it hosed you all off. It's okay now. Now you're a golden shell back. So, right. got the plaque, got a card. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many of them did you participate in? Just one. Just one. Thank oh. God. Well, you know what? That stinks because if I would have went back over, I would have been able to initiate. Oh. Uh, okay. So I didn't get the part to initiate. The, the I didn't get the part to do that. Okay. Too bad. All right. <laughs> Okay. Anything else to remember from everyday life on the ship before we uh, talk about something else? Uh, no, pretty standard, you know. You either had a 4 to 8 watch or the 8 to 12 watch or the 12 to 4 watch, you know, engineering. You know, the 12 to 4 watch, uh, was the, of course, you had 12 to 4 a.m., 12 to 4 p.m. I never did like the... Um, was that what watch was it? The twelve to four watch, the twelve to four watch, the eight to four, eight to four. Uh, you know what? They all kind of stunk in a certain way. Some of them you got to watch the movie over. Some of them you didn't get to watch a movie over. Some had a long day. You know, we stood watches watch from all the way from four in the morning till eight, and then you got off at eight o'clock. But you still had to do your work day. So you had to work your eight-hour day until four o'clock, and once you got up at four o'clock, you got to go back on watch on. So you, that was a long day. So, but that was the everyday life, you know, on the on board a ship. Okay. So. Uh, so let's talk about interaction between uh, officers and enlisted. Uh, so you didn't have any personal encounters with any of the captains. No. Uh, but what about the executive officer? Nope. Okay. I try to keep a low profile. All right. Yeah. The only time I had a problem with my commanding officer, not my commanding officer, my the guy in charge of the division, I remember sucking through my teeth at standing up. At, we mustered in the morning, and I was, like, sucking through my teeth in the morning. My wife knows what she mean, what I mean by that. And that guy just came over and says, what are you doing? And I says, oh, I'm sorry, sir, I was just sucking through my teeth. You know, that's annoying. And I remember the evaluations was the next month he evaluated me all on that. All my evaluations dropped because of that one little incident. You know. So was he was he was in charge. He was in charge of the division. Okay. So was he an ensign or lieutenant? Uh, lieutenant. I believe he was a lieutenant. Okay. Yes. Wherever you are, 
I can't believe you did that. All because of that one little sucking through my teeth. Right. Uh, how is the relationship between like them or the NCOs or other enlisted? Uh, it was all right. They, they were permanently, they weren't rough on us, you know. They just basically told us, hey, what we needed to do during the day, and we did what we needed to do during the day. Okay. I remember, I think it was, we were in Beirut, and we were out for 30 days. I think we were supposed to get a beer after so many days out. You know, they said, okay, if you're out for so long, you get issue beer to people on, on board. We never got our beer, and I remember going up in the, in the officer's lounge up there for something, and I seen all these pallets of beer. I'm like, what? That's never pass out our beer. <laughs> they never passed our beer. That's where our beer went, right there. Them guys never passed our beer out. They even hoarded it all for themselves. You know where the beer came from? Uh, no, probably on stores. I don't know. Oh, but, yeah. okay. But like I said, it may be, maybe it could have been somebody else's. But you know, it's kind of funny that you know you never got your beer, and all of a sudden you see cases and cases of beer up on the. And the mess is seeing the captain's mess, or not the captain's mess, the officer's mess. Oh, okay. Uh, on board, uh, you had any encounters with Soviet units, like whether aircraft or well, vessels? Well, when we were in um, Beirut, uh, there was a lot of other ships floating around. Some were Soviets, and um, um, they probably were sitting there observing us, what we were doing. And I remember a bunch of helicopters flying around, Planes flying around. I remember one time seeing a, I don't know if it was an Apache or a Cobra helicopter. They were actually hot dogging it. They were actually trying to, you know, fly down and see how low they can get to water. And they were kind of scooping down like that. Well, one of them didn't pull up fast enough, crashed into the water. Man, it's like I was right there. They, uh, it was like, what's that? How much money is that Cobra helicopter? So, um. Basically, I had an inter interview with a couple people, officers, because of that incident. And they asked me how, they actually put me back on the main deck and they told me, okay, how, and they had a guy out there demonstrating what he tried, he was doing, what, trying to repeat what he was doing, how far was he above the water and all that. But one of the helicopters were hot dogging out there and actually didn't pull up fast enough to crash into the water. It's kind of embarrassing, embarrassing in a way because you got the Soviets running around, they're probably laughing, you know, at us. But... That was kind of an incident, you know. Right. But this ship didn't respond to that crash, did it? Or some other there was other there? ships out there. I'm not sure if we put lifeboats in the water for them or not. I don't know if our lifeboat crew, I think our li I think a lot of lifeboat crews went in the water for them. But they really, there was only one guy, maybe two guys in there. I don't know if Cobra, I don't know if there was two or one in there. But I believe that's all the only thing we responded on. Okay. Um, so. No word on the casualties? I don't remember. No, I think he got out. Okay. There was, he didn't pass, he didn't get hurt or anything. I think he got out. Probably got um, disciplined, but. Okay. Uh, anything else remember while you were on board the battleship? Uh, what else? Mm. I was going to talk about ports of call next. Um, eh, we could go to Ports of Call. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Actually, we'll talk about the one Ports of Call. I remember going to, we were in Beirut, we went to, had, we went to Egypt. And uh, I had duty the first day of Egypt. We pulled on, all our crew got off the, you know, Liberty in Egypt. All of a sudden, crisis broke out in Beirut. We turned around and left everybody there. We left them all there. It's like, what, what? So I remember manning the aft steering. You know, so we were flying them aboard as we were going back to Beirut. You know, they called them all back in Egypt. It's like, okay, I, I got, we went to Egypt. I was on duty the first day. Never got to see Egypt, you know. Meanwhile, I had to go back to Beirut. They figured out, they probably figured the ship wasn't there. And they started acting up over there. But they, they actually flew them all on, back and forth helicopter going as we were flying, or as we were taking off to, back to Beirut. Oh, okay, so some people didn't get the message or didn't yeah, get them well, in time. Well, no, they left them. They actually turned around and went. They pulled anchor and mm -hmm. left. You know, they didn't have time to wait to collect the crew. So they, as 
They did say that they had, went around town and was uh, announcing, hey, they have to go report back to the station, report back to the base. And they were flying them back on the ship as we were headed back to Beirut. Okay. So. Right. Any other ports of call that stand out? Every port of call I went to had its own situation that, that I encountered that was interesting to me. So not really, there, I, I had things that I went to Singapore, I went to Manila. There were interesting, interesting things in all those ports. Hawaii, there was an interesting in that port. Um, Israel, we went to Israel, Haifa, Israel, that was interesting. Uh, France, we pulled in the Riviera, that was, there was interesting things in all those ports, you know? So, okay. but I don't know if you want to speak to all about, I mean, I could go on here for an hour talking about all those ports. Okay. You know? If there's anything that stands out that you, know, you remember. Um, hmm. Manila, we went to Manila, I remember getting off um, the ship in Manila, and they had us, they had people on shore bringing us in, and they had us in these boats that had little motors on them with long props on them. They, they, they drove us into shore, and they said, okay, get out. And there's no dock or not. We had to jump out. We're in, we're in dress whites. I'm rolling out my legs, pant legs, taking off my shoes. We jumped right in the water to go on shore to, for liberty. That was, an, that was an interesting thing there. Uh, Hawaii, I went to port in Hawaii. We scuba dived in Hawaii. That was interesting. I, was, I scuba dived. Um, so that was something to do. It was really crystal clear water. It was really amazing. You know, a bunch of us went on scuba diving. You know, and um, ports of call. Let's see, Israel went to see Masada. I think it was called Masada, where they these people back a long time ago took refugees refuge on a hill, and all the Romans were around and they couldn't get up the hill. There's one path up the hill. I think that was called Masada. That was interesting. Seeing the Dead Sea. Uh, France pulled into the Riviera. That was neat. Uh, went to the beach. Everybody probably knows what I'm talking about. Went to the beach, you know, little France. They, the women are topless there. It's funny. My wife's my wife's right here, by the way. There is two two girls, exchange students. Me and this guy were on the beach, and um, it's like, oh man, he's, you know, look look look, look at this beach and just all these women with topless, and it's like, you know. And these exchange students, they were hearing us talking. I was like, oh, you from the service? Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, we're from, we're exchange students. We're from America. And we're talking. We're really having a good time. And he says, we like to tour the ship. And it's, oh, yeah, okay, we'll tour the ship. So me and this other guy took these two girls and toured the whole ship, you know, in, in France. And after, it's, okay, man, what, what do you girls want to do now? Oh, we're done. We want to go. I'm like, what? You're done. We we ain't done. Oh no, we're gone. They kind of. It's funny because they kind of used us to see the ship, and uh, we were just like, oh no, we've got things to do now. It's like, you know. So they were Americans. <laughs> yes, they were American exchange oh. students. Yeah, and, but it's like it was funny, you know. So like I said, every port I went to, had a little event that okay. is memorable. All right. So. So touring was allowed on the ship. Yeah, actually, they let, they let them on. They let them on. Okay. Yeah, you would think it wasn't that what it wasn't allowed, but no, you we signed them on. We were responsible for them, so okay. we we left them toward the ship with us, of course. Yeah. All so. right, so guided tours. Yes, yeah, so it was a guided. I mean, well, it was we signed them on. I don't know. It was we we gave them a guided tour. Okay. Yes, it was uh, just us, me and another gentleman, which I can't remember the other gentleman's name. Okay. So. Uh, any like interactions with uh, civilians with any of the ports that stand out? No, actually, believe it or not, I remember in Israel, Israel liked us. They, they, they were, they, they liked us there. They, you know, I remember one bar, they bought, bought us drinks, you know. Um, any other ports? Um, no, not really. Okay. I didn't have any. T oh, you know what? There was a reaction I had in Italy. Um, coming back to the ship, I remember, I used to always keep my wallet in my front pocket. And, um, Coming back, a guy come up to me and bumped me and says, hey, 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 what are you doing, what are you doing? And I said, get away from me. I'm, I always have a tendency to check my wallet as soon as I get bumped or anything. That guy took my wallet right on my front pocket. pocket. With, I mean, you know, you think you keep it in the front pocket so you would, you know, get stolen. I turned around, and I, we were right in front of the base, too. I turned around and said, hey, where's my wallet, where's my wallet? And, and, and the guy said, come on, come on, don't start no trouble. Where's my, I was like, where's my wallet? He goes, oh, it's right there. 
pointed the ground. He threw that wallet down, and I didn't even realize he grabbed it. It's amazing how they got that. Shore Patrol started walking up, but once he threw it down, I picked up my wallet. On the way we went, we were done. Okay. So. Right. Did you have interaction with serv mem service members from other nations? No, I did not. Well, no, not really. Seen some. It's funny, in Israel, you, you um, walk around, you see everybody walking around, all the other service people walking around with Uzis, you know. They're in, they're in the bus stations, they're all over the place. And you know, I guess the women serve there too. Yeah, they do. Yes, they have a certain time frame they have to serve. You know, so it's strange you're walking past a uh, nice looking woman with an Uzi. Like, you know, but uh, basically, you, basically that's all the interaction I really had. Okay, yeah. like not too much conversations with no, them. No, not like, too much conversation. Okay, yeah. but were you in uniform and they were in uniform? So you were telling Yes, I basically, a lot of ports we were in, we were in uniform. Yeah, yeah, I think all the ports I was in, was uniform. I think France, maybe not. Yeah. But most of the ports, I think we had to represent our ship, the battleship New Jersey, you know, so they will always want us in whites or blues, depending on the weather. Okay. All right, and uh, you left the ship in... 1986? 1986. Okay, and that's when you left the Navy? Yes. Okay. Yes. Anything you remember from leaving the ship and going to discharge? No, I was kind of happy, you know. You know, I, I'm glad I did this. I'm glad I did my, serve my country. But if I had to go back there, I probably wouldn't do it again. It, I, I enjoyed my life I got now. To, you know, the sailor life was really not for me. But... You know, once I got out, you know, I got a house, I go to my own. That's what the big thing was. When you're on a ship, you know, you, you're in a big room with a bunch of guys and you share the same bathroom, you, you share everything. But now I got my own house, I go to my own refrigerator, I sit in my own chair. So actually, sailor life was really not for me. Okay, unless you're a captain. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> unless you're a captain. All got right. your own room. So. Okay. All right, so... Uh, looking back uh, at your time in the Navy, is there anything the Navy had an impact on your life that you took with you? Yes, actually machine. I still do machining today. I've been machining all my life now, practically, since, well, since I got a, out of school. So, um, so once I did that, I got out and I continued. Actually, I went to school to learn com to computerize, called CNC, num numerical control machines. Okay. So I went to school because I put, my mo I put money in it wasn't a GI Bill, but it was something like a GI. Every dollar you put in, you got a dollar from them. So I put money away. So once I got, I uh, went to a school to learn CNC, computerized machines. So actually, I'm a machinist still today because of it. Okay. So, yeah. All right, so well, we're just about coming to the uh, final questions of this interview. Uh, so... Uh, when this ship became museum, like starting to become museum back in like 1999 and 2000, did you get to watch this ship hit the news? Yes, I did watch it. I watched it coming up the Delaware River. You know, I did watch it. I, I was pretty intrigued on it. I think it went under, it, it, it drove it under its own steam till it got to the Delaware River, I believe. And then was taken over by Tuds? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I did, I did keep it, watch that. And I always, actually, how long has it been here now? How long? Uh, it officially opened in October of 2001. Yes, and ever since it got here, I wanted to take a tour of the ship. I just, you know, yeah, didn't feel like I wanted to do that. My family wanted to, was interested, wanted to see that. You know, so. And I guess I even have sleepovers here. We yes, sleep the over. nights. We actually have one tonight. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's like, wait a minute. They want to charge me to sleep here. I slept here for four years, and they want to charge me to sleep on this ship? I said, <laughs> they paid me to sleep on this ship. <laughs> and they're going to charge me to sleep on the ship? So I said, you know, I don't think I'd want to do that. Okay. So, so almost 20 years later, you finally... Yes, okay. almost 20 years later, right, exactly. Yes. Well, welcome home once again. Yes. Well, just welcome. Home is Pittsburgh now. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so. Great to have you back. All right, so uh, final questions. First one is, is there anything that I didn't ask or talk about that you would like to say? 
Um, no, actually, you did a pretty good job. Okay. Ask some of the questions. All right. I don't know if my family has any questions. Okay. Well, I don't see any sticky notes, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, so last question is uh, for Legacy. So uh, your interview will be stored along with almost 400 yes. uh, archived here. And we just pass well over 30 minutes, so the Library of Congress will take this. Yes. So they're going to permanently archive this recording, as well as the State Library in New Jersey. And maybe a few years later, another institution is going to archive this. Sounds good. Yes. So is there anything you'd like to say as a way to leave a message to whoever might be watching this in the future? Um, I can't imagine what the future will entail, but probably might be a little bit easier with the way computers are coming along, but it was an interesting life aboard the Jersey. That's all I got to say. Okay. Absolutely, sir. Well, uh, this can close our interview. So, first of all, uh, Mr. Ackman, I want to thank you for your service and thank you for uh, coming down to have us interview and record your story. And uh, this will close our interview. So, once again, my name is Hugh Song. I'm the assistant of the Oral History Program here on the Battleship New Jersey, which is docked here in Camden, New Jersey. And today is Saturday, June 22nd of 2019. So this interview and any transcripts, abstracts, or indexes will be stored here on the Battleship New Jersey, as well as the Library of Congress Veterans History Project and the New Jersey State Library Systems. And all recordings will be, will be made available to writers, researchers, teachers, and historians. And I'm Hugh Sung signing off. Thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Hugh Sung with the Battleship New Jersey Oral History Program. Uh, we are on board the Battleship New Jersey, and uh, we just completed an interview with uh, Mr. Uh, David Ackerman. Uh, who served on this ship during the 1980s, and we are now in the F steering of the battleship New Jersey, where Mr. Ackerman uh, had his uh, first duty. So, um, sir, um, would you mind talking about uh, what goes on here? Yes, F steering. This is um, where my first duty station was. I was non-rated at the time, and they were assigning me to hy uh, hydraulics, which was F steering, deck wenches, anchor windlass. So, basically, I'm looking at uh, two systems here, two motors and one rudder, two motors, and depending on what motor they wanted to run is what they operated at the time. Of course, when I worked here, there was an arm here. You know, you shift it back and forth, they must have redid some different designs back there, you know, and two, two wheels, one for one unit, one for the other unit, and every time we had to switch units, we had to switch the arm in the middle. Sometimes that was tricky because you'd have to get zero pressure on both systems. If you didn't have zero pressure on both systems, the system would lock. As soon as you throw that arm, it would lock. And it, you could hear the pumps humming and rumming. So you always had to have zero pressure on both. And, was, and if sometimes it locked up and you couldn't get it, we shut down the motors. We'd actually go down, power down the electrical boards so the motors both shut down so we could shift the arm and then continue on our way, kick them back up again. So. But oil, oil replenishing pump that took uh, oil from the tanks down underneath and supplied oil as we needed. There's a servo motor back there that keeps the pressure on the motors to, uh, so they don't lose pressure for the, in the expansion tanks. So it was, it's a pretty interesting system. Yeah. Okay. Bring back, do some watches here. This is where I stood watches a lot. Ask steering up around for what watches. So. Okay, so uh, for the historical record, um, you don't mind like clarifying the difference between this section and the other section over there? Uh, this is the star. This is the starboard rudder. That's the port rudder. Okay. Each, like I said, each each rudder has two motor units, and each, each there was only one system that had one motor unit on it at one time. Of course, it's, these are all backups. You know, one motor goes out, you got the other motor to kick to. You know, you got port and starboard cables for both units, cables coming down from the right side, cables coming down from the left side, something happens during battle, we switch from one cable to the other, depending on um, the situation at the time. Sometimes we'll switch them back and forth to make sure they're all okay, systems are all okay while the ship was on its way. So, but we would switch units back and forth over time, to, depending on the officer of the deck, he would say, okay, we need to switch to 
um, starboard unit, port unit, and we would switch back and forth. Okay. And that's just, like I said, it just supplies hydraulic oil back to the rams back there. And depending on the direction of the hydraulic fluid, which way, where the, where the oil going, what side of the ram is, depending on which way the rudder is moving. Technically, you could steer with one, one rudder, you know, you could, you know, something happened to this unit, so now you still got another rudder. You could put this, try to get this midship, and steer off of one rudder. And they also say if you lose Aster and completely in a battle, they say you can actually steer with the propellers. You have four props, you can steer by four props. So, but. Okay. All right, you can talk about this compartment, from, sir. From them pumps, hydraulic fluid will flow into these rams. Now, when the hydraulic fluid is flowing into this one and that one over there, it would push the rudder that way. Those arms would go that way and turn the rudder. And then when you want to turn the other way, it would suck out of here, go back into the pump, come out of the pump, go back into there, and then turn around the other way. Basically, that's a basic concept. Okay. Yes. So for the viewer who's watching this, we are in the aft of the ship, and the rudder is basically here. This could be so. called the ram room. They might have called this the ram room. But from my recollection, of course, it's been a while. while so they, I believe they call this a ram room. So and the rudder is actually right there, right underneath there is a rudder. All right. Uh, you mind if we come up there so uh, yes, sir. we can show the viewer? See these these arms are attached to the rams that are inside there. The rudder's right here, and these arms move back and forth depending on which way, where the flow of hydraulic fluid goes. This was a sensor to see where, what position it was in. And basically, there's nothing to do it. Actually, basic, basic steering. And of course, there you'll see one on the other side, just like this. Two rudders, one identical room on that side. So basically, the rudder's right there, got the gaskets holding that water back from coming in. Okay, so this would be moving while the ship yes, was this turning. Would be going back and forth. You know, sometimes we'll come back and we'll see, you can see, just, and you can hear the humming of the hydraulic oil through the pumps, or humming through the pumps. Yeah. And this thing would be going back and forth as we're going. Sometimes we'll be back here. It's kind of a nice, quiet space away from everybody back here, actually. All right. But you, know? you would have to stand clear while this is moving. Believe it or not, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't like. It wasn't driving hard. We were back there, we were walking around, it was moving back and forth, it was not a big deal. Right. That door was always open, you know? Right. Would you keep it lubricated? Um, yeah, we, there's a, uh, what they call PMS, preventive maintenance system. And there's actually a PMS card that tells you when, how often you grease these things. Okay. Yes, Pre preventive maintenance. Of course, with the deck wrenches up front, up on top deck, they had preventive maintenance cards for them too. Interesting. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, once again, this is Hugh Sung with the Oral History Program at the Battleship New Jersey. Uh, we are right now in the Battleship New Jersey machine shop, and uh, Mr. David Ackerman, uh, who served on the Battleship, this was his uh, second uh, duty station. So, uh, Mr. Ackerman, why don't you talk about uh, what goes on here? Yes, um, basically, um, we machine valves and um, shafts up here. Basically there's a shaft here right now. You never know, I could have made this thing years ago. But it basically made shafts like this, had to turn them all down. We um, cut bells in here. And basically on my oral, um, in my oral interview I mentioned how I had to cut a valve. We were dead in the water. And this is the actual machine I cut it on. Okay. The valves. And a captain and a chief engineer were standing right there looking over my shoulder while I was cutting the valve on this machine here. I remember that. We were dead in the water, waiting for a valve to be cut. And turret lathe, big drill press. I didn't use the drill press too much. And used the turret lathe a lot. You know, had a shaper planer, shaper planer here. We used that um, every so often. And press, you know. Every machine in here I was using. You know, we grind our own tooling, all rocker tooling, um, okay. rented everything in here. Had to make a small gear on here at one time. I remember doing that. Okay, you want to yeah. come in, sir? Yeah, we'll do that. Okay.
Yep, worked here for three and a half years. This is actually what I did for three and a half years. Actually, believe it or not, I had my name stamped in here, but they covered it up. Um, the group of us, I think there was five in the machine shop at that time. All five of us stamped their name on the floor over here. But I see it's been covered up now. But made, made plenty of pump shafts here. Plenty of pump shafts. Any part that the ship needed at that time and needed manufacture while we were at sea was made here. Anything. Okay. Disassembled pumps, disassembled motors right there, and made bushings, you know, while we're at sea.